Hello everybody, um, my name is Paula McCall, um, I'm one of uh, the, a member of the uh, community group called Lara Heritage, I'm the secretary of the group but um, really the group is, is only as strong as its parts so um, some of the people, other people who are supposed to be here with me today couldn't but I'm delighted to see other members from Monaghan uh, local um, heritage network here and um, our heritage officer Sherry Clerken. So I'm from um, an area in County Monaghan, South County Monaghan, called Lara. Um, Lara was a milling village. Um, we didn't put any of the beautiful assets there. Uh, we were lucky enough to live in the village, and most of them were gone by the time um, our community group established. But one stood, just about stood, and that was the Tin Church in Lara. Um, I grew up not far from Lara, and I moved there in 2010. And um, when I moved in. The church was in my in my eye shot, I suppose. I always knew it was there. Growing up, everybody knew it was haunted. Nobody passed it after dark. Every Halloween, every people heard chains rattling. Nobody looked in the gates. It was one of those places that nobody looked at. But like when you stood back and looked at it, it was absolutely beautiful. So in the Christmas, we moved in in 2010. And anybody who remembers 2010 remembers the winter. and. <laughs> the 32 days, I'll never forget the 32 days of no water that we had because our house was newly built and unfortunately we had the pipes above the ground. So uh, there was a lot of days of walking in the snow and on one of those days I was out walking along the race bank in Lara and I took some photographs of um, the Tin Church. And I was, I knew a lot of my neighbours but some of them I didn't know. Now we were relatively unaffected by the, the boom so um, still though there were some people who I didn't know. So I made some Christmas cards, I put the Christmas image of St Peter's on the front and went through the village with uh, some of my younger children and put them into everyone's letterbox and just said wishing you happy Christmas from all the McCalls to see if anybody came back. So I was duly surprised at the amount of people who came back with Christmas cards and inquiries as to where I got the image and could they get a copy of the image and you know I suppose when you stand back and there's things around us all that we don't necessarily stand back and look at but a dusting of snow made the tin church illuminated it and um, um, so that started I suppose started the interest in it and um, from there we had to figure out who owned it and uh, we had to figure out if anyone owned it and we there was local talk about it some people nobody declared ownership and nobody declared non-ownership of it so um i set off to dublin and spent a day in the office looking through old deeds with uh, one of the representatives in the office and we couldn't find any ownership um, of who owned the church so um came home and really I suppose thought nothing more of it to an extent and one day I got a call from the guy in the office and he said you know what I've just figured out who owns it it belongs to the Church of Ireland now it belonged to the Church of Ireland by default because um, the Church of Ireland members were buried on the grounds and because the guy who built the church who was the land or the mill owner um, who owned the, the Lara Mills um, he had had a couple of services in it so two of his daughters got married there and there were a couple of other services so by default the church of ireland owned st peter's tin church so the next step was to contact the church of ireland so dropped them off an email and didn't hear anything back for a while but eventually the rector came back from the local parish and um, he came out to meet us and when he was unsure where Lara was, because the church has been deconsecrated since the 50s. So we met him on site and we both stood back and we both looked at it and I said, isn't it gorgeous? And he, and he said, I suppose it is, you know. And I said, you know, could, do you think we could work together to, um, to see if we could fix it up or, you know, even cut back the ivy and, you know, the usual things that we all have to do to keep <coughs> these buildings from standing. So he said, well, yeah, we could look at it. So the next point of call was to go to our heritage officer. And I'm delighted to see Shirley here today. Shirley's been inspirational and she's been a rock of support all the way through the process of, of uh, conserving St. Peter's. Um, so obviously we needed a community group. So it made absolute sense to go back to all those people who put the card back in my letterbox. So we set up a community group and we had a first meeting in our kitchen in Lara and we had seven people at the meeting. 
um, three married couples and one man whose wife wouldn't come with him. So um, myself and my husband, uh, our neighbours and their partners and one other guy. And we set up the community group and we had our first number of meetings in Lara in our kitchen and then realised quickly that we needed more people, we needed more uh, skills and we needed more local involvement. So we moved the meeting down to the local pub and then we had no problem from there on. We had loads of people. Every time we called a meeting we had 18, 20, 25 people, no problem. And the work started. So that's the synopsis. But um, my background is in tourism and... Um, I suppose we had to find uses for the building, we had to find what its end use was going to be and we had, everybody has loads of ideas on these things and thank God for all the ideas um, and thank God for all the knowledge that is, runs in the background behind that from our previous speakers today and from our heritage officers and conservation officers and advisors in the department because without them I mean we all, I know what I'm good at and we all know what we're good at but none of us are good at everything. So I think that's the biggest thing that we learned as a community group was to ask questions, to take things slowly, to take small bites, because um, as one person in the group keeps reminding us, there's only one way to eat an elephant and that's one piece at a time. Um, I know a lot of you here are from community groups, so my presentation today is um, very much about how we did this as a community. Okay, so. As I said at the beginning, we could, we'd never have done it without the supports, without the department, without our heritage officers, without all the experts. But as a community group, we made a decision on the first day that we were going to conserve this building, no matter what. Well, the story that we tell, it depends on the audience, but the story that we tell most tourists to Lara is that the building uh, was brought back as a honeymoon gift from the male owner for his wife. And she, they were on a uh, honeymoon in Switzerland. She fell in love with this building he had a replica made and brought back and put up in Lara for her so she could settle in there. It's built um, as though it sits on the Swiss in, in, in the mountains in Switzerland so if you visit it um, it sits on, on, a, on an outcrop of rock so the rock literally comes up under the church and the pulpit sits inside. It's called St Peter's because it's built on the rock. There's loads of different um, uh, links to St Peter with this church. It has its cockerel on the top St Peter is in the east window and um, the guy who built it had, had one son and he died in a horse riding accident in a boarding school in England and he's buried in St Peter in the graveyard in St Peter's in Birmingham and the east window of this church is a memorial to him so we're not 100% sure why it, why it was built or where it originally came from but as I say depending on the audience the story slightly changes everybody loves the romance so we tell that one a lot but either way everything around the church is ri ri rigid everything about the church is straight so can you, can everybody see that it sits uh, very clean um, in a picturesque glen there's ferns all around and there's this there's a, a river that flows quite quickly <coughs> around the back of it it's it's a beautiful place and it's in a, in a wooded glen so as i said lara was famous for mills it had um, these uh, linen and tweed mills back in the, during the milling boom, but when that ended, the mills closed. Lara at one stage employed 700 people. After the milling boom ended, those people disappeared, most of them. The village was left in ruin. Uh, the church, the mill owner died. The church um, was deconsecrated. Uh, all the Church of Ireland population in the area left. And then if you fast forward to 2010, whenever we, set, we started our group, uh, the population of Lara is about 35 people, maybe 40 people, you know, in the immediate village. So we've got bits of buildings everywhere that fell down, and uh, the church sat uh, in a very bad state of disrepair. Um, it's built on wall plates. I wish one of the one of the group is a, an engineer, and if he was here, he could tell you all the uh, detail about exactly how it's built. But lucky for him, he's in Australia for a couple of months, so I ha you have to, to to do with this. But it sits on four wall plates, and it's an original timber build, so um, it's sheeted with tin. It's it's a very simple design. It was easy for us to repair because it wasn't um, uh, you know it wasn't like a, a, a big church with stone etc. Like that, we didn't have the the high costs. The church. Um, I'm just going to let that play on. This is the image we had for Christmas, and, and it'll run on from there, and you can look at the images. So we applied, uh, we went down and we spoke to Shirley about what to do. And really what had happened was somebody had tried to, to um, 
start work on the church and the county council duly had put a cessation order on it because there was no clear direction as to where the, the individual was going or what exactly it was that they had hoped to do. So when we formed the group, the, our first stop was to go to Shirley. Um, and Shirley told us, you know, our different, uh, the different uh, avenues we could go down and one of them was for funding was to go to Leader. So we went to Leader and Leader, um, these are pictures of what it was like, I suppose, at the time whenever we, whenever we inherited. The first ones were what it's like now. These, unfortunately, are what we had to deal with at the time. Um, so we went to Leader and Leader basically started us on the process of what, how much money we were going to apply for, how we were going to match the funds, where we were going to come up with the, the, the um, match funding and how we were going to retrospectively claim, etc. So um, at, the time, uh, at that time we had to go to um, the department because we had to go through Heritage Review. So first step was Declaration 57. As a community group we got our Declaration 57 through the local authority and the local authority paid for that and we've used that as a blueprint and we still use it as a guideline as to exactly how to go about uh, our project. Um, after the Declaration 57 we went to, we applied for LEADER and we got our LEADER funding um, on the basis that we would uh, we would meet the criteria and one of the criteria for leader was um, heritage review. So our next step was to meet the department and again with the support of our heritage officer we were put in contact with a guy called Mark Ritchie who was our um, conservation advisor through the department and Mark uh, let, told us that we'd had to go, um, we had to get a conservation architect and because the building was considered to be unique or you know of significant architectural and built heritage um, we were we had to get a conservation architect of uh, it was grade one I think he was he was def he was Mar uh, Kevin Blackwood was his name fantastic guy uh, supported us from the beginning when we had to come up with um, alternate when we came up with our suggestions as a community as to how we'd overcome an issue and uh, Kevin told us that that wasn't going to happen that we had to do it this way because this was the right way uh, he he didn't just tell us it and leave us with it he told us it and he advised us out how, how to get across it and uh, any questions we had we would always go back either to Mark Ritchie in the department or Shirley down in the council offices and I suppose as a group from the beginning we decided that we no matter what we weren't going to uh, fail we weren't going to stop like it, it, it took uh, from my part my part in the in the group was I'm the secretary and and I suppose my background was uh, in tourism and I had a clear vision as to what I thought we could get from the building. Other skills in the group we had, we were very lucky with the group actually, we didn't set to, sit down with a recipe but we were very lucky in that we had an accountant and we had an engineer and we had a lady whose background was in ecology, <coughs> we had um, people who had a, a vast ex long experience of being in community groups and then we had the local community. So we weren't... Um, foolish or silly in relation to what we could achieve but at the same time we needed constant guidance as to what we were going to be allowed to do. As a community group we had made a decision from the beginning that we weren't going to challenge that, that we were going to work with the agencies and see how to get across those barriers and I have to say, who, I, I'm not sure who I'm looking at here who's in community groups but that is the only way to do it, that's the only way to do it. Like once you accept that you have to do it this way and you stop challenging that there's help at every point along the way to help to get you across the line. So we um, had, as I say, we had great support with our conservation architect and there were some things in there that, like we were dealing with relatively simple materials but there were, and there were some things we wanted to keep and there were some things that we wanted to get rid of and that he would say, no, look guys, you can, you know, you can save and you, know, you can keep going with the things we have, etc. So we, fin we, we completed the church in a, in a one year and eight, one year and eight months we opened it um, in September 14 and since then Leader only really got us to a point where the church was, was no longer going to fall down. We still had, it's a living project, we still have to raise money for it all the time. We had the windows to do, we had the internal woodwork to do, we had the pulpit to build, you know, we had projects ongoing and projects 
ahead of us and projects that we may never get to do but it, I suppose we never again we hadn't it in our head that we were going to finish the project turn the key and walk away and that project that building was done and um, as for the uses of it we've been constantly challenging ourselves to come up with uses and as you might have seen for some of those slides we've constantly been challenging ourselves with events and different fundraisers we've had traveling choirs from the US we've had guided walks and talks we put in a Fairy Glen, which is so popular with the kids whenever families come around. We reinstated the Millerace Walk, and it, it's a, a short one kilometre. We do an awful lot of stuff with the kids. Anything we do, we involve children in it. We develop this community biodiversity allotment, and the, the kids plant in it. We've had weddings in the church, which is great. This is it decorated for the harvest. Um, and this is one of the projects that we're doing at the minute. We're trying to rebuild the pulpit, and we're trying to get the windows painted on the inside. This is a small amount of there actually most of those are married couples <laughs> in that one but um, that's a very small uh, a small um, idea of the group at the minute we are raising money for um, to build the pulpit and put back in the windows um, our engagement with the department and our engagement with local heritage is, is ongoing we no matter what it is that we decide to do next we always get their advice first um, it's not so much, you know, I suppose the biggest challenge with the group was to keep the herd moving together. Uh, there's an awful lot of voices from the outside saying you should never have applied, you should have just raised the money yourselves, you'll never get the money off leader, you know, they'll do anything to stop you from getting the money. We hear, these, are vice, these are things you hear all the time in community groups, but I suppose what we had to do was to stay focused on the job at hand, which was to tick the boxes, to do what we were told, and in the end we have a, a project that's uh, worthy of, of itself. You know, we, we didn't try to make it, as I say in the video, we didn't try to make it anything different than it was. It was just a conservation project. Um, its uses are wide and varied and it's becoming so popular with people. We continually have emails and requests about could we do this and could we do that. Now, in terms of electricity, we did put an external uh, electricity point at the back of it and we can bring electricity to it, but it's not um, wired or anything like that. We, we didn't have to go through the planning procedures and, thing, and that because we didn't ever intend to put electricity into it. Um, it's very, its uses are wide and varied. Its, its future is secure. It's not going to fall. It's not going to fall on our watch. The reason we keep the kids involved in every event is because it's theirs to keep after this. Like, and I was driving my kids to school this morning, and they were saying, "Why, why are you not going to work? Where are you going?" And I said, um, "I'm going up to Dublin to, to talk about the church now. Like, poor children at this stage are like, don't talk about the church anymore." <laughs> but um, you know, but I said, um, whenever we want, whenever we approach the Church of Ireland for a lease, the Church of Ireland offered us, us a lease for 999 years. So I and and my son said, "Oh my God, so we have it forever." And I said, "No, we just took one." I said, "The community group weren't happy with that because some of them were worried they wouldn't be around." And uh, and it took a second for it to sink in, and then uh, he started to laugh. And I said, "We took it for 25 years, and we uh, we put an opt in to that we'd opt out after 10 if the, if it was a thing that the community group felt overburdened by it." So we put we took it for 25 years, and I said, and 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 he said, can we have it again after the 25 years? And I said, no, we can't, but you can. It's not. It's going to be yours then. So I suppose you've got to remember that. And things I'd say to any community group are small bites. Work with the agencies. You know, keep the community. Try and keep the community all forging ahead together. Um, try and keep the negative thoughts out because um, if you do things slowly and you work with the, the, the relevant bodies, they are achievable even, even on a level as small as ours when we started with seven people. So that's us. Uh, Lara is a, a outside Carton Cross on the N2 and it's signed. Um, we got ourselves involved with Ireland's Ancient East and we got ourselves onto the Ireland's Ancient East brand. So uh, if you're passing by, call down. It's open every day and um, manned by the community itself, all in the voluntary capacity. Thank you.